say it again, you've been had. Birdie, no, no. It's a go lightning. Once again. No white eyes will ever see his face. I think you know how the world works. Say hello to my little friend. Oh, You're missing the point. It's true. Are you quite sure about it? It only danger. happened once, but I'm so ashamed. 100 years on and still grueling to watch, but let's compare two lynching scenes from early American films. The first conveys the fears of a solitary black man for his likely fate as he's taken away by a mob of violent whites. The second focuses far more on the perpetrators, a gang of black Yankee soldiers lynching a fellow black and then shooting another black man who tries to come to his aid. You don't need to be a history scholar to know which scenario was by far the more realistic and common occurrence in the post-Civil War United States. And yet it's the second film, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, that endures in cinema's canon. While the former, African-American director Oscar Michaud's Within Our Gates is, at best, a rarely seen shadow Hollywood history. Birth of a Nation, adapted from the Thomas Dixon novel The Klansman, is flat-out glorification of white supremacy. It lionized, even helped reanimate the Ku Klux Klan, and depicts its black characters as ignorant, lazy, dangerous schemers out to bespoil America's innate, i.e. white, innocence and purity. Yet African Americans themselves are marginalized in background roles. The main villains, as with Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer, are played by white actors in blackface. Mammy. Mammy. A holdover from vaudeville's minstrel tradition, blackface dates from slavery when blacks were forbidden to perform on stage. It later continued with African Americans darkening their own skin with burnt cork, complicity in the lampooning and grotesquery, the only way to get along. History Written with Lightning was President Woodrow Wilson's famous judgment on Griffith's film in 1915. But it was a bolt of white lightning, electrifying the silver screen and recharging a dominant and malign cultural power grid. Griffith, apparently stung by accusations of racism, offered as an excuse for his blackface cast that black actors simply were not available. One wonders just how hard he looked. In the race movies of Michaud and other filmmakers, African-American actors regularly appear in their own stories of great sophistication and humanity that expose and attempt to rebalance the mainstream bias. In a way, Peter, we, uh, you and I don't belong here, and we'll never get anywhere as long as we stay here. Why don't you go away, Peter? Away up north, where most of our educated people have gone. Up north, where you can be free. Tragically, these films were plagued with financial and distribution problems. To this day, all too few are screened or survive at all. And so, when your first landmark feature is this, Mommy. and your much heralded first talking picture's most famous scene is this, can you really deny that your national cinema was founded on racism? <laughs> As the talkies rose, traditional blackface faded, but its pernicious cinematic legacy lived on in other forms. Come on in before you catch your death of dampness. Codified by derisive black stereotypes. Come on in here! Harmless, good-natured and loyal. With no solace in his stomach. Or untrustworthy, sly and threatening. Anything more complex was effectively blackwashed out by the dominant racially homogenous studio system. Black performers basically had to take the very little they could get. I bet she gonna blame me. Even without blackface, there's more than one way to elide or erase minorities on screen. Whitewashing. It is done. My father's spirit joins the sun. White actors with darkened skin or altered features to play more exotic roles became the default industry setting. And I, I do not wish a change. It is within me. I share your taste in women, Target Ty, but not in blood. Farewell, Tartar woman. Robbery, ladies, kind of gentlemen. Please to introduce myself. Sakini by name, interpreter by profession. The name is Vargas. You won't have any trouble with me. You bet your sweet life I won't. 
not. Did I not promise thee a miracle would fall from heaven from the prophet Muhammad? And was not this so? <laughs> Once again, I must have brought death! Sure, there's a difference between straight-up racist caricatures. If you bethink yourself of any crime, unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace. Solicit for it straight. Alas, my lord, what do you mean by that? And traditions of established actors playing Shakespearean leads. I would not kill thy unprepared spirit. But today, both look antiquated and frankly offensive. Just as well that whitewashing is a misguided trope from a bygone era, right? I mean, who today would casually engage Chinese actors as Japanese characters? We do not become geisha to pursue our own destinies. Or cast Native American or Hawaiian American characters with all American stars. Something even Johnny Depp's Cherokee ancestry claims don't quite overshadow. There is no end. Or showcase an ethnic impersonation so lazy that it's even billed as a generic Asian minister. The list goes on and on. Get your hand off it or use it now. In our ostensibly more enlightened times though, surely at least the rationales given in such instances are more subtle and nuanced. Well, yes and no. Ridley Scott's economic argument is the same self-perpetuating excuse from Hollywood's golden age. Big budget films need big, i.e. white, stars. Any cultural responsibility gets washed away by the money. You wonder what I see in your future? Possibility. Scott Derrickson's response to Tilda Swinton's Doctor Strange casting is more interesting, since it suggests an active pushing against racist cliches that still, perhaps inadvertently, fell foul of racial bias. What a beauty you are. They have improved us so much. Mamoru Oshii's defense of the US remake of his Ghost in the Shell makes sense in theory, yet aesthetically the new film leans heavily on its Japanese predecessor. Most bizarre of all is the ultimate revelation that Scarlett Johansson's major is in fact the ghost of a young Japanese woman. A pretty unusual strategy to avoid whitewashing accusations. Oshii's statement is right to pinpoint political motivations for the criticism. But it's less about being woke than the need to be awake and alert to issues of race and representation in 21st century art. This gets more complicated, naturally, when those involved, like Oshi here, seem to condone a whitewashed status quo. Chinese-American Jeff Ma was one of the MIT students who made millions outwitting Vegas casinos. In the movie adaptation of their story, 21, his character had morphed into clean-cut American Ben Campbell, played by British and decidedly non-bankable actor Jim Sturgis. Oh, thank you. Uh, but I'm, I'm really not the right guy. Ma called the resulting outcry overblown. Can one condemn sadly familiar justifications, financial or otherwise, against casting non-white actors, yet still acknowledge that some choices aren't clear-cut or, forgive the phrase, black and white? I will let you go again. The rush to swift and unforgiving judgment in modern social media and identity politics often favours simplistic, sweeping statements over complexity and nuance. Acting like you some one-man GPS? If blackface is now, to use a favorite current term, cancelled. Tell them what time it is. I believe you people. Huh. Is this? What do you mean, you people? The same as this? These are the 80s, man. It's the Cosby decade. America loves black people. If whitewashing is increasingly and justly 
coming under fire is this. Then you are a true prince of Persia. As problematic as this. Or somebody spoke his language. Who gets to portray who anymore? And who gets to decide? Well, I understood that, sir. Alan. This shifting, often obscure grey zone is where we'll venture in greater depth in part two. <laughs>